Hello. Today in each of the weeks I'll be looking at the upcoming reading, uh, the stuff that you're supposed to be responsible for the, for the uh, by the end of the week, and um, I'll focus on five sort of things uh, in each group of reading. So for the first bit of reading, you only have to read the first part of chapter two. You might want to look at chapter one at some of the high points in chapter one just to give you that background, um, you know, some of the points, like what is a myth, what's mythological corpus, those sort of things that are addressed in chapter one. But mainly you're going to be reading the first part of chapter two, and that might seem like it's not that much of a reading, but Hesiod's Theogony, which makes up most of that, is in fact um, quite uh, a challenging work to read. So I do urge you to sort of get on that um, and definitely focus on what's in the theogony. Uh, the other thing that I want to say about uh, that is if for some reason you don't yet have the textbook, there is in module, the module for chapter two, there is a, um, a copy of the theogony in a translation by um, M.L. West. Uh, that also has sort of like annotations. So like in others, I, I copied and pasted it, and then I did annotations as footnotes. So it's a different translation than Lombardo, Stanley Lombardo's, which is what you have in the textbook, but still it would cover the material, and uh, it's a good translation, so it's worth looking at. I think Lombardo, who is himself a poet, I think captures some of that quality um, that, of course, West does not have in his prose translations. So we're going to look at five things uh, connected to um, the Theogony, um, a poem uh, by Hesiod. It's about 1,100 lines long. Um, if this were performed, uh, it would take uh, maybe about 60 to 70 minutes to perform, to, to read aloud, um, or to perform it aloud if you had, you know, if you had it to memory. Um, so first of all, what did the world look like to Hesiod? Now, the reason that I'm tossing this in is that Maurizio doesn't really speak about this, but I think it is important to think about the, the way that Hesiod and the people that Hesiod was composing for would have thought of the world. Um, and one of the things is they um, would have seen the world as sort of a sphere. Now, the world itself, the, the place, the earth, the part that we live on, would actually have been seen as a disk. So imagine a disk in the center of a sphere, so sort of bisecting the sphere. That is the earth. It is surrounded by a river called ocean. And this is, you know, like basically when you got to ocean, there was no real land before beyond that. Now, there seems to have been the possibility that you might have had the Blessed Isles out somewhere in the middle of the ocean, but it's unclear. But at any rate, so imagine it's a disk. Above the disk is a dome. That dome is the sky. So the dome, it, the sky is seen as a solid mass that the stars of, are affixed to in the nighttime. So it is a dome, um, but it is also solid. And underneath it, there is a bowl, and that bowl is the underworld, and the deepest part of that bowl is Tartarus, the place of sort of punishment, and the, the part of the underworld you definitely, when you die, don't want to end up. So that's the sort of concept. So keep that in mind as, we, as you read Hesiod. That's how he's imagining the world to be. Now, a brief word on the castration of Uranus. So the first god mentioned in um, in the Theogony is Uranus. Uh, he's not the first one mentioned in the total poem because Zeus appears before um, listening to the muses sing. But in the story, he's the first character, first male god to appear. Um, Uranus is the Greek word for sky. Uh, Lombardo spells it O-U-R-A-N-O-S. Um, this is the more Latinate spelling, which is the spelling I'm used to, and it's pretty much the spelling that like Mauricio uses. Same figure, different spelling. Now, so both are legitimate spellings. Uranus, the sky god, he was 
given birth by Gaia, the Earth. So Earth gave birth to Sky. And then Sky was seen as a figure that matched Earth equally so that it, Earth, the, the Sky covered Earth. Now, Hesiod does not address this matter, but there are versions of the story where Sky and Earth are solid masses, one on top of the other. They're stuck in a coital you know, position, sort of like dogs, and they can't get apart. Now, the problem with that is any children that they have have nowhere to go because, right, they're stuck. But the castration of Uranus in this case, and in other versions, the male god is the earth god and the sky is female. But whichever god gets, ca which, whether it's sky or earth, it gets castrated. Once the castration happens, then the sky springs up and forms a dome over the earth. Now figures have a place where they can move around. Now keep in mind when you're reading, the story that gets told is that there are some hints that Hesiod's inheriting that idea because there's a bit about how sky sort of covered Earth completely, right? Which implies one plane on top of another equal in size. But we've got this like harsh dynamic going on, uh, dynastic dynamic going on where Sky doesn't want to give up power, and so Sky shoves his kids back into Earth. Well, if the original version was they couldn't come out because the Sky and Earth were stuck together, that's one thing. But Hesiod or his his tradition that he's representing want to emphasize that you had this one ruler, Uranus, who was cruel and also wasn't overly smart, right? Because by basically causing Gaia pain, right? Shoving kids back into a pregnant woman would cause all sorts of pain, mental as well as physical pain. This would be awful. And so Gaia is going to hate him and all the kids who can't come out are going to hate him. So basically Uranus is standing alone with everyone else allied against him. Well, in the short term, you know, he can do that for a while, but eventually something's going to happen. And of course, what happens is uh, Gaia convinces Cronus, the youngest of her, her children, the Titans, um, and um, gives him a sickle, and then he castrates uh, Uranus. Now, Cronus appears to have been an agricultural deity, hence the sickle, but in this case, he's using it to prune his father's genitals and then uh, throw them away, that thereby rendering him sort of unmanly and therefore no longer in power. Right, so that's the setup. Um, and there are other um, mythologies where you have this power dynamic between an older generation and a newer generation, and in some cases they involve castration. Um, so, you also have in this account, you have a different Aphrodite and a different Eros. Eros is the god of love. The Roman name is what we generally call him by Cupid. Um, the way most people think of Aphrodite and Eros is that Eros is the child of Aphrodite and Ares usually, while Aphrodite herself is the daughter of Zeus and Dione. But in, in Hesiod, Eros is one of the first gods to appear, right? In the first like half dozen gods, Eros is there. And Eros is pretty much defined as this urge to merge, right? The, the, the desire to hook up and reproduce, right? So that's that driving force. Um, so Eros is actually older than Aphrodite. Aphrodite in Hesiod's account is produced not from Zeus, because Zeus doesn't even exist yet, but rather um, the uh, she comes out of the sea from the scrotal sack of uh, Uranus that had been tossed into the sea. So it starts bubbling up. She comes out of it, and then she sort of uh, travels over the waves and ends up ultimately on the island of Cyprus. She comes to Scythera, and then she comes to Cyprus, where she sort of walks onto the land, and then grass starts growing. Um, 
That story is important for a couple things. One is, it seems almost certain that Aphrodite probably was not originally a Greek deity, but the, the, the Greeks sort of inherited her from the Middle East. So there would have been gods like Ishtar, Inanna, and then there was this a god, goddess on Cyprus called Ashtart. Uh, all of those goddesses probably are sort of like variations that merge with the Greeks into Aphrodite. Now, in the poem, this idea that she sprung, springs out of the sea, which might be an original concept, is, um, uh, you know, is, is explained by Hesiod as giving her her name, saying that the name Aphrodite means from Aphrodite, the foam, the foam that gets produced when the scrotal sac lands in the sea, it starts to foam up. That etymology for Aphrodite is false. I mean, we don't know what Aphrodite's name means. It does not seem originally to be a Greek name. So it's, it's, it's the Greeks adopt the name, but it seems to be actually probably not an Indo-European thing. They got it from their neighbors and then um, tried to explain the name. Um, so keep, keep all of that in mind with, with um, Aphrodite. And the fact, the fact that she, in the story, lands up on Cyprus, which was her main cult center uh, in ancient Greece. Uh, Cyprus is just off the coast of Phoenicia, so it is the, it is the part of Greece that is the most connected to the, to the Middle East, right, to the Near East area, to, to the Levant, and to Anatolia, to Turkey, which is right above it. Um, and in fact, it, you know, in the modern world, um, Cyprus has been under control of the Turks or under joint control of Greece and the Turks. So um, that connection on that island, although the island, the, the people who live on Cyprus speak Greek uh, and spoke Greek, uh, you know, for quite some time. So uh, that's, but her connection with that ties her to this whole Middle Eastern uh, and Anatolian idea of a fertility goddess. The story overall of the Theogony, which literally means the birth of the gods, is not so much about that, although the gods' births are mentioned, but it's about the rise of Zeus. If there's one story arc throughout the, the poem, it is the rise of Zeus. When we first see Zeus, he's listening to the muses tell these great songs and sing these great hymns about him. So he's listening to basically his press corps come up with like great stories about him. That's when we first see him. Then we get a story leading up to the fact that Cronus, the son of Uranus, overthrows him, but then Zeus, the son of Cronus, overthrows Cronus and then is in power. The Titans and the gods fight. That's the Titanomachy. And Zeus and, the Titan, Zeus and his allies win, uh, partly because Zeus was smart enough to ally himself with the Cyclopes, and with the Hecaton Kairos, these sort of monster figures with a hundred hands uh, and fifty heads, because they provided uh, lots of like firepower for him. So this is one of the things about Zeus that makes him different than Cronus and Uranus. He's much better at building alliances and giving people a part of the pie. Therefore, they're more willing to defend him, who actually sort of controls the pie. Um, so, um, and then after that happens, Gaia produces some monsters called giants. And giants seems to be connected to Gaia, right? Giants, so you can see there's sort of a similar sim similarity in the name. Um, they're born out of Earth. Uh, they are just from her. And they're rendered suspicious because they're monsters, right? They're not natural. And so uh, they, they come out of the earth and then they're just as tough as the Titans. Zeus defeats them. And once that happens, Gaia leads the sort of uh, bandwagon to get Zeus um, set up as king pretty much forever. So the, the, the th you know, the, an overall thing in the poem is you've got this uncertainty in heaven, which presumably would reflect uncertainty on earth, but that now Zeus is in charge. He's in charge forever. You can't get your mind around Zeus. He's very smart. And so that means a certain stability. doesn't mean life's great, but it means that life is something you can count on. 
Um, so that seems to be the sort of overall arc of the of the work. Now the work has things in it. It has hymns. It has catalogs that are not really part of the narration. They're not part of the story. But um, there is a story arc, I would argue, to the work, and it is the rise of Zeus. And one last thing that I want to talk about is the appearance of the muses. So Greek epic poets, these are poets who are, are, are composing in a, in a verse form called dactylic hexameter. Uh, it's a long line. Uh, it's a very sort of stately sounding line. That is the, that is the verse form that Hesiod would be using. It's the verse form that Homer is using. All of these epic poets, and the Roman poets as well, always invoke the muses. They always call on the muses to help them, the poet, tell the story. Because the muses know it, and the, and the poet is sort of the, the conduit for that knowledge. Now, in this, we actually have the muses physically appear in the story to Hesiod, who is tending sheep. Now, what, a couple things about this. It is unlikely that Hesiod was actually tending sheep uh, as an adult and suddenly was inspired. Right? That seems to be a fiction. I think that this fiction is something that Hesiod probably used whenever Hesiod performed. And of course, he's an oral poet, right? The way people are getting his work is him performing it before an audience. It's there. No one's reading it in a book. You're reading it in a book. No one in the ancient world is reading it in a book. They're listening to some performer perform it. And so when Hesiod was performing, I like to think that this might have been his calling card. You know, why should you listen to me, Hesiod? Well, let me tell you the story. The muses appeared to me once and they breathed their voice into me and they gave me this laurel branch, uh, which, you know, indicates uh, like a walking stick made of laurel, which, of course, indicates the connection with Apollo, who's also a god of poets. And it shows that I am a poet. I am a person who, who can, you know, sing song and uh, is why you should listen to me. So it sort of establishes his cred. He, he also has the muses insult him as a shepherd and says, you know, you shepherds are basically nothing but a bunch of pigs. You're just always eating all the time. You, you know, you're good for nothing. Again, that seems, I think that's part of the setup. If I'm nothing, but the muses are inspiring me, then what you're hearing can't be me because I'm nothing. It must be straight muse. So what you're getting is the source. You're get I'm just a conduit. And I think it's a setup for the audience to sort of get in the mood. Oh yeah, we're gonna hear something good now. The muses are just sending this stuff to this guy. He's like a, a you know, a radio set and he's just picking up these waves and he's just gonna deliver it as he as he hears it. Um, so it is sort of a convention. Um, now for an oral poet like Hesiod or like Homer, um, the muses would be would be very important. These are the goddesses of memory. They're the daughters of memory, and they're basically the goddesses that inspire the person performing to, to be in the moment, to, to really listen to the story and deliver it. The worst thing that can happen to a bard would be for the bard to like get halfway through and say, yeah, now, now what? I, I, there was something else I wanted to tell you, but I just don't know. That can't happen. Right. Once the performance starts, the performance has to go through. I don't know if you've ever seen like a classical music uh, performance where um, oftentimes if, if you're we're looking at a piano recital, um, the pianist will not have the music before. The, the pianist is supposed to memorize the music and it's just performing it. Um, I once saw a performance where, for whatever reason, the, the pianist in the middle of the work basically lost his plays, didn't know what was going on, and simply stopped, stood up, left the stage, didn't come back out and say, I'm sorry, but, you know, I'm just, it's just not. And the audience, you know, was sort of, I, this was a free concert, so it wasn't like, you know, we were like, oh, I want my, my money back. But we were sort of upset and perturbed because the guy had some other options, right? He could use improvisation to get him through a part where he was sort of, had forgotten, and I know people who've done this. I've, I know, I have friends who are who are you know pianists, and sometimes they said, yeah. And sometimes like I forget a section of the thing, and it's about maybe a minute long, so I just basically noodle for a while, and then I get back to the music, and the audience generally doesn't notice. 
that so the point is you got to be able to keep going so calling on the muses is not entirely like just for show now later when we get to the roman poets the roman poets are writing the poems out they're taking a long time to write the poems out so it's all very carefully crafted even though they would still be reciting them to an audience they're probably reading them to an audience um so that you know they have the script in front of them and yet they still have this this convention of like let me call the muses to help me come up with the names of all the people that aeneas had to deal with and da, 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 da. so it, it's the convention stays on but for a poet like hesiod and a poet like homer this is the real deal without that inspiration without that sense of you know the story and getting through that story um the poet is going to fail and so um that that can't happen all right so those are five points that i'd like you to consider as you're reading through um the hesiod theogony and the, the introduction about it which talks about creation stories um and i'll see you next time